What's up, family? It is Therapy Thursday. Come on in, pull up a seat. Let's go ahead and give God your undivided attention. There is an important session for today. If you're streaming for the first time, let us know in the comment section, this is my first time streaming. All of my cousins around the world, let us show our first time guests, our family members, how we feel about them. This is Therapy Thursday. We're so grateful that you are here. So many of you send correspondences to Flowers and I, um, and you let us know how this is impacting you. We're so grateful that we are able to provide you um, this Therapy Thursday and that it impacts you the way that it does. We congratulate, we speak life over you. We thank God for you. Why? Because you're taking your maturity, your spiritual growth, your emotional development, you're taking all these things into consideration and it's important to you. That's why you're here, because it's important to you. Somebody type in the comment section, I'm ready, I'm ready. Let's get to the word. I know that we're going to look at Genesis chapter 38 today. So I want, I want you to make sure that you go to Genesis chapter 38. You put your finger there. We're going to come back there and we're going to talk from a subject um, that is relevant at this very moment and something that I believe can help many of us. And if it, if it doesn't help you, tell you what you can do. You can package this message, this session, and you can hand it to someone who needs it. Let's speak life over one another in the comment section. Let's encourage one another because you have made a conscious decision that I am going to grow. I am going to get better. I am going to be the best possible version of myself. Let me pray with you. God, I thank you. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for this opportunity to learn your word to hear from you. We thank you, Lord, for this Therapy Thursday. And God, I decrease that you may increase. You know the things that we bring to this space. You know us because you created us. So now, God, meet us at the place of our greatest void. And God, I pray that when we leave from this space, that we're better because we spend time here. Let your presence meet us here right now. It's in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said together, amen. Listen, I'm excited about today's session. We're going to look at two characters. I want you to write these two names down. We're gonna look at a man by the name of Judah who has been given a great mantle. He's a man of authority. He's a man of leadership, right? He's a man with a calling on his life. And we're gonna look at a woman by the name of Tamar. You, many of you, you you've heard this, this passage read before. You've probably heard me even make reference to it. Um, once or twice before. But there is a relevant message, very simple, that I want to share with you. We're going to talk, we're going to assess their lives. We're going to assess both Judah, a man of leadership, and Tamar, who is his daughter-in-law. And I want you to take some time to to spend with the word of God on your own, chapter 38, even after this space, right? We pray that God gives us what he wants us to have for today. And so what you need to know, we're gonna begin reading at verse 11, and I'm going to talk from a subject. We're going to share. We're gonna have a conversation from the subject, that's not a healthy relationship. You need to know first what are some signs. And I know we've we you've heard many variations of this from various people, and I, I know you probably believe that you don't need to hear anything else about this. Um, 
but I want to encourage you to just lean in, lean closer, um, to be reminded because sometimes you can be in a situation that looks healthy, um, feels healthy, when in fact, it's still unhealthy. It's just not as unhealthy as the previous relationship you were in. All right? I want to look at Tamar and I want to look at Judah as well. And I want to I want us to have a conversation about overstaying. I want us to have a conversation about self-abandonment. Like, like self-worth, self-control, and self-abandonment. There's something significant about why we overstay in relationships. Why we would much rather stay in a relationship where pain is familiar. And this is what they teach us. Many times we overstay in relationships where pain is familiar because we would rather remain connected to familiar pain than embracing a pain that is unfamiliar. The fear of pain, they are, we're often taught, is even more painful than pain itself. Just the fear that pain could possibly occur. Many times we overstay. Why, why are we overstaying? Why are we subjecting ourselves to unhealthy relationships? Why, it, do you know that relationship you've been tied to is unhealthy? Are you taking any steps? Why, why are you remaining there? Or do you know someone who's in an unhealthy situation? Or uh, are, are you fully aware of this and you don't care? Like, I want to give you a couple of things to consider as we look at Judah, who has a son by the name of Er, E-R, and then has another son by the name of Onan, O-N-A-N, and then who has a third son by the name of Shelah, S-H-E-L-A-H. And so what happens is Judah, a man of authority, a man of his word, a man of leadership, a man of, of, of character, he is supposed to get Tamar and arrange a marriage for his son, Er, E-R. One thing leads to another and the marriage dissolves. It, 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 it dissolves. So then in return, Tamar is supposed to get married to his second son. That doesn't work out. And now there's one more son left and Tamar is impatient. Somebody type impatience. She's impatient. And this is where we're gonna pick up. I wanna read the text and then I wanna give you some things to consider. I believe this can help you. And so then what happens is she is impatient and she takes the relationship in her own hands. She takes the relationship in her own hands and she finds a way to manipulate her way into a relationship. And whenever you have to force your way into a relationship, that is a clear sign that that relationship is unhealthy. I know you're saying, well, you're not telling me anything that I don't already know. You need to hear it from my lips. You need to hear me repeat this. You might know this, but if you know this, then why are you still where you are, right? So it's one thing to know, it's another thing to know. So I want us to look at Tamar, but I'm not going to take Judah off of the hook because the both of them show us the power and the danger of abandoning yourself when it comes to a relationship. And sometimes we can desire to be in a relationship. Sometimes we can be so impatient. Sometimes we can have the biological clock running. Sometimes we can have people in our ears. Sometimes we can have so much going on that we abandon ourselves for the sake of that relationship. 
Let's talk. Let's talk. Can we have a conversation? Like, like, what is happening in Judah's life? What's happening in Tamar's life that we arrive to this place? Let's read. I want to get to verse 11. Let's go to verse 11. Verse 11. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my son Shelah is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend to do this because he was afraid. Somebody say, somebody type fear. He was afraid Shayla would also die like his two um, brothers. So Tamar went back to live in her father's home. What happens when your expectations and your plans and the desires and the image that you had in your head is not working out the way that you plan? So now you have Tamar who had planned to be married by now. She's reached aged, she's reached her peak, and the image of marriage, family, the white picket fist, fence, the split level home, like that is being threatened. And so I want you to read what happens next. Some years later, Judah's wife died. After the time of mourning was over, Judah and his friend Hira um, went up to Timnah to supervise the shearing of sheep. Someone told Tamar. Someone began to whisper to Tamar, look, your father-in-law is going up to Tim Timnah to shear his sheep. This is where it gets interesting. I'm just going to read a few more verses and then we're going to have a dialogue that I believe will be helpful. Tamar was aware that Shayla had grown up who she's supposed to get married to. But ain't nobody talked about engagement. Ain't nobody talked about, you know, any type of ceremony. No arrangements have been made for her to come and marry him. So this is where this is where you put your highlighter. So she changed out of her widow's clothing and she covered herself with a veil and she disguised herself. And before you convict her before you talk about her. She disguised herself. She changed who she was so that she can achieve a goal. People pleasing, the need for validation, insecurity, insecurity, like there's many things that happen when we change who we are to get a particular result. So look, she changed out of her widow's clothing, covered herself with a veil, disguised herself, and she sat beside the road of the entrance to the village of Enaim, which is on the road of Timnah. Judah noticed her. The Bible says that Judah saw her. And he thought that she was a prostitute because of how she was, how she was, her posture, where she was located. And it said that he thought she was a prostitute because she covered her face. Somebody say she's hiding. Somebody say she's disguising herself. Somebody type, she's covering herself up. She's disguising herself so that she can get a particular result. She's denying who she is. She's changing who she is. She is lying. She is manipulative because she's impatient. Because she wants the relationship so badly. The relationship cannot be the destination. Marriage cannot be the destination. Marriage is a journey, not a destination. But for her, there is a destination that she desires to get to. And now that this is the destination, by any means necessary, she's going to get there. I'm going to keep on reading. Judah noticed her, thought she was a prostitute. He stopped, pr propositioned her. Let me have sex with you. Now, here's a man of leadership. Here's a man of character. Here's a man of authority. Let's look at the lack of self-control. Not realizing this was his daughter-in-law, how much will you pay to have sex with me? I'll send a young goat. And he promised. 
She says, but how do I know that you're going to send the goat? Now, this is where I want to end the reading. And then I want to talk from the subject. That's not really healthy. Like, do you realize that's not healthy? You've seen it so much in your home. You've seen it so much with your friends. You've seen it so much in culture. You've seen it so much on television that you think that that is normal. That's actually not healthy. Actually, you as a woman don't need to pursue him. But you've seen women pursuing. You've seen women being in control. You've seen women having to make the decision so much. And you saw your mother having to be the one in control. You've seen all the women in your family having to move a certain way. So for you, it is normal. But what if I told you that that's not healthy? Come on, come on, come on. Come on. So he says right here in verse 18, what kind of guarantee do you want? You want me to guarantee that I'm going to do this for you? What do you want? And this is what, look at what she reaches for. She reaches for three distinct things that belong to Judah that make up his identity, his identification seal what he needs to stamp documents so that if he needs to seal any document, if he needs to send it, that he can put his his seal on it so that they know that it comes from him. It's it's equivalent to our identification. Like like he's he has this. He has a cord that connects this to his his body, but he also has a staff, which signifies in many cases authority. And she says, give me all three of those things. If you give me those three things, then I know that you mean what you say. And he gives her these things that are unique to him. He relinquishes what is unique to his own identity. What is unique to the authority that he has. He offers this to her in order to have sex with her. He abandons himself because he wants sex with her so bad because he's grieving. He's impatient. He doesn't have self-control. So in both scenarios, you have a woman who is abandoning herself for the relationship. You have this man who is abandoning, abandoning himself because he wants sex. He doesn't, he, he, he lacks self-control. And the both of these individuals are entering into a covenant and she has a destination in mind and he has a destination in mind. You know the relationship isn't healthy when both people in the relationship have two different destinations in mind. You know that the relationship isn't healthy when there is no relational direction. He wants to have sex. She's aware of this, but she desires to have children because she wants to get married. How often do two people end up in a covenant? One person just lacks self-control and the other person lacks self-worth. And so they both enter into a relationship and they think they want one another until they both get what they desire. Those are two different things. And now that they get what they desire, they're both now abandoning the relationship, attacking the relationship, and they both get what they want. But this is not a healthy relationship. Somebody type, that's not healthy. That's not healthy, that's not healthy. Just look at it, look at it, look at it. He gives her his identity, seal. He gives her his staff, his authority. He gives her the chain. And then he has sex with her. And the Bible says that after they consummate this and after they have this covenant, enter into this covenant, she leaves, goes home, and she changes out of her clothes as was her pattern, her practice. Three months later, she's pregnant. People get word in the town. Man, Tamar is pregnant. Man, she she deserves to be stoned to death. Judah's going to now stone her until he realizes that she was the one who he had sex with. And that's how the story unvelops. But if we press rewind, let's take a couple steps back. A couple of things I want us to consider. A couple of things I want us to consider is this. 
There are few signs to determine that a relationship is not healthy. When you have to force the relationship, Tamar, like when you have to be the one that's in control, like when you have to assert yourself, you know the relationship isn't healthy. Just think about this. I understand that there was a promise. I understand that there is a desire for companionship. I understand that there are unmet expectations. But whenever there are two people and one person has to do all of the work, one person has to do all of the pursuing, one person has to do all of the courting, and the other person isn't following through with their word. Somebody type, that's not healthy. You need you need to know this. You need someone needs to tell you this. Second thing, when there is no relational direction or clarity. I've just said this a few minutes ago. He desires sex. She desires marriage and children. He doesn't want marriage. Marriage isn't on his mind. And he hadn't been talking about it. She hadn't even talked about marriage anymore. But it's in her mind. And many times when two people get together and they don't talk, they don't communicate, and they don't find clarity about their destination, then the both of these people end up in a relationship with unmet expectations because they were first unexpressed. So when your your expectations are not communicated, you can never expect for your expectations to be met. But she wants the relationship so badly and he wants sex so badly a man that not does not have self control a man without self control is a dangerous man so let's look number 1 when you have to force the relationship number 2 when there is no relational direction or clarity number 3 You know the relationship is not healthy when you cannot trust the word of your partner. Whether you like it or agree or not, they're in a relationship. They're in some form of covenant. It wasn't something that Judah desired, but he's in a covenant. I don't think it's something that Tamar ultimately desired, but she settled for it. But the reason why she moved the way she moved was because she could not trust his word. He said he was going to get her married, but he never did it. He never had the intention to follow through with what he said he would do. And when you are in covenant with someone who when they speak words, you hear them but you don't believe them and you have to move accordingly because you never believe what they say, you got to ask yourself some critical questions. Why are you remaining in a relationship with someone's word who you cannot trust? If you're not actively working toward some type of resolution, if you're not actively working toward building trust, why would you overstay Or why would you remain in a relationship where I hear you, but I'm still moving in a way that says I don't believe you? So, you know, the relationship is not healthy when you have to force it. When you have to put so much pressure on the relationship, when you make it the destination. When there is no relational direction or clarity. Like, where are you going? When do you all plan on getting there? Number three, when you can't trust your partner's word. And number four, you know the relationship is not really healthy when your character is compromised. Judah 
relinquishes his identity, who he is. He gives it up. He hands it off. He gives his staff, his authority. God gave you authority. You're in leadership. You have character, but you're willing to compromise that. Oh, come on, come on, come on. Come. So when your character needs to be compromised, or when your character is compromised, just to sustain the relationship, you know that it's unhealthy. Somebody say this unhealthy, that's unhealthy, that's unhealthy, that's unhealthy, that's unhealthy. You know it's unhealthy when you no longer recognize you. Like when you look in the mirror, you can say, I don't, I don't recognize me. So, number one, two, three, four, number five, you know that the relationship is unhealthy when you need to be in control. That's number five. That's what that's, that's what it says. When you when you need to be in control. And what I mean by that is when you operate in fear. When you're in survival mode, in most women, that is why when you're in the relationship, you always have to remain in control. You got to be the one that's fixing. You got to be the one that's moving. You got to be the one that holds everybody accountable. When you're in a, re- a marriage, when you're in a relationship, you don't. You shouldn't be in survival mode. When you're in a relationship, you don't. You shouldn't have to be in control all of the time. And so when we look at this case study, when we look at this scenario, one of the things that is impactful is that she takes everything in her hands. Like everything is in her hands. Tamar said, if anything is going to work, it's going to be because I do it. Do you really want to be in a relationship where you have to do everything? where you have to make sure that he does what he says he's going to do. And you got to make sure that everybody follows up the way that they're going to follow up. And you got to make sure everything works out. That's exhausting. And if there is not reciprocity, if there is not balance, if you have to abandon yourself, If you have to disguise yourself, if you have to put on other clothing, if you have to become someone else, if you have to become unrecognizable to yourself in order to salvage or save a relationship, it is not worth it. Somebody type, it's not worth it. Let me give you one or two more. You know the relationship is not healthy or it's unhealthy when there is no self-control. This man does not display self-control. We can uh, say the same thing for Tamar. But I want us to be able to understand that they both play a role in what is unhealthy. She can't trust his word. He doesn't have self-control. He abandons his leadership as a man. Right? Because he wants something so badly. (laughs) Right? And so that is powerful and impactful. And she is impatient. She needs to be in control. She desires the image of marriage so badly that she's willing to abandon any and everything else. Why would you stay somewhere unhealthy? Let me give you one more. Number seven. Let me give you number six is when there is no self-control. Let me give you the last one. The relationship is unhealthy when there is no trace of God's presence. So let's take one step back. 
where is God's presence in that relationship? I'm asking a question. Where is God's presence in that relationship? Where is God's presence in that relationship? When you cannot trace the presence of God, if God is not in it, you should not want to be there. If God is not there, you should not want to be there. When you assess this entire text, you can't trace God's presence. And if I can't trace God's presence on you, then I don't know if I really want to pursue you. Like, I need to trace God's presence on your life. The relationship is unhealthy when there is no trace of God's presence. It's a higher probability that I'm going to abandon myself and make the relationship idolatry if God's presence is not there. Someone needs to type this. You can't self-abandon your way into a healthy relationship. I don't care how you twist it. I don't care how I don't care how you make it sound. You can't lose yourself into a healthy relationship. Like you can't abandon yourself so much that all of a sudden what is toxic is going to become healthy. Never. It won't happen. I don't care how you try to fix it. I don't care how many children you have. I don't care how much money you make. You're still going to suffer the consequences or the people, the children, the family uh, behind you, after you will suffer because you abandon yourself. You cannot self abandon your you cannot self abandon your way into a healthy relationship and self abandonment is what happens when you make someone else responsible for your worth self abandonment begins when you make someone else responsible for your purpose. Self-abandonment happens when you make someone else responsible for your peace. Self-abandonment happens when you make someone else responsible for your value. I'll give you something else. Impatience will have you settling for substitutes. You could become so impatient that you'll look over your life and nothing is authentic and everybody is just a placeholder because you need to have it right now and not in God's timing. That's not healthy. It's not healthy to rush the relationship. It's not healthy to be in control all of the time. It's not healthy to not trust the word of the other person. It's not healthy to abandon your authority and your leadership as a man. It's not healthy to, to not apply or practice self-control. It's not healthy to, to, to not have clarity or direction in your relationship. And now you're just here existing. You're just having sex and you're just going through the motions. Y'all just hanging, but there's no clarity. She wants marriage. He wants sex and they not talking about it. So they're just in each other's presence and they're getting their needs met, but they're really not getting their needs met. So they're really unhappy, but they're just coexisting because that's all they know. And that's not healthy. That's not healthy. Mm. 
You can't keep giving to the relationships in your life that are not giving back to you. You can't keep giving to the your heart to a relationship that's giving you heartache. You can't keep giving your heart to a relationship that is giving you pain in return. So just looking at this, this scenario, looking at the power of self or, or abandoning oneself because you're impatient, you don't understand your worth. What does healthy look like? Healthy is reciprocity. Healthy is growth. I'm not where I desire to be, but I'm not where I used to be. Health, healthy is empathy. It's putting the other person's concerns and desires um, at my windshield so that I can think about them uh, in a way that is considerate. Healthy is saying, yeah, you know, my flesh desires to, but I know that I don't need to. So I'm going to hold myself accountable because I need to have self-control and as a man, I need to lead better. Healthy is saying, I would love companionship. I want marriage. But if it's not God's timing, then I'm asking God to help me and keep me to be patient and to trust in his will. Healthy is... I can do it, but I'm not going to do it because it's not my responsibility in the relationship and I don't want to overstep and I don't want to be the one that's doing everything because both people have to show up to the relationship in equitable ways. I can, but I'm not. I can fix this, but I'm not going to fix, try to fix this because if I try to fix this and I'm going to try to fix everything, no, it's not my responsibility to be her therapist. It's my responsibility to be her boyfriend or her husband. Healthy is growth. Healthy is I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do. And if I fall short, I am going to own and I'm going to be accountable for my actions and my behavior or what I did not do. Healthy is forgiveness. Healthy is let's be clear about where we're going. I don't know if I see that in my future, but I respect that you see that and that's something that you desire. Like healthy is communication. Healthy is dealing with conflict in a mature way. Somebody say, I'm pushing, I'm, 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 I want healthy. Somebody say, I want healthy, I want healthy, I want healthy. Give me healthy, give me healthy any day. We have a responsibility to build healthy relationships around us, not just romantic, but every relationship. We're responsible for fostering and cultivating healthier relationships. And it begins with you. You should not have to abandon you for them. And if you have been abandoning you for them, this is what I want you to do. Today, I want you to choose you. T -t Today is the day I leave you for me. That's, that's my, Today is the day that I leave you for me. Because you can't help anyone. You can't be anything to anyone if you're not first being what you need to be to yourself. Lord, I thank you for this word and for this time together. More importantly, above all things, can you be present in our lives? We want to trace your presence in every relationship. We want you to trace, we want to be able to trace your presence in our lives today. God, we need you right now.
Yes, God, show us what unhealthy looks like, but also display to us what healthy is. Because we desire to have healthier relationships. We desire to be healthier people. We desire to be who you've called us to be, the best version of ourselves. We want to bring glory to your name. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all have a wonderful day. See you in a couple of weeks.